Today, meet Peter Tomsett, Bentley owner and aficionado. And meet this beautiful and authentic 1954 Bentley R. Owned and cherished by Peter for many years, but before that having a fascinating history and provenance, as we'll find out. My name is uh, Peter Tomsett, and uh, at the moment I'm retired, but I do have an interest in old cars, which uh, does involve me in the occasional wedding use of my cars. Well, since my passion has been um, the Bentley, I've had lots of vintage cars of different kinds over the years, but uh, in 1972, I met my first Bentley, a 1934 three and a half liter Park Ward saloon which I still own, and uh, that car will probably never leave my ownership. But uh, Bentley is the most appealing mark to me. I'm regional chairman for the Northwest for the Bentley Drivers Club. And uh, the car you see behind me, of course, is my 1954 R-Type, which I've owned for coming up to 10 years now. I bought the car from uh, the Real Car Company, which are in Bethesda in North Wales. A very nice company run by a couple of very nice blokes, very straightforward. I actually went to look at another car, um, a Rolls Royce built in the 1920s, but they were very honest and told me that it was the steering was shot and I looked at the car and I could see that there were a lot of things needed doing. So I walked away and this car was in the background. But uh, later on, I looked at their website and this car was still there and I thought it was very attractive and uh, went down and had a drive and uh, ended up buying it. This uh, car's history is quite fascinating because uh, from the Mark point of view, the first uh, post-war model built by Rolls-Royce was the Mark VI Bentley, which was very successful. The first time they built their own all steel bodies. Prior to that, cars were coach built. So this was quite an innovation. Uh, unfortunately, they did stick with some rather old fashioned ideas and the car had a very small boot and a luggage rack, which people did not take to very much and you couldn't get your golf clubs in the back of the car easily either. So they did a revision after a few years and they extended the chassis by six inches and put a totally new <clears throat> boot on the car. Uh, the boot lid is made of aluminium to keep it lighter, but uh, it's now quite a cavernous boot and gives the car a much better line. The styling of this car, I think, is rather delightful because it's a pure art deco. If you look at the top of the headlights, for example, and the top of the side lights, there are these small chrome decals, the curves of the wings, even the tops of the doors are cut away and there's a razor edge line on the back of the bodywork, all of which uh, emulates the style of the pre-war coach builders to a large extent, bearing in mind that this was a car that uh, was only for the very rich. It was, in fact, the most expensive car you could buy uh, in, in its day. So um, styling was all important. Space inside, of course, with uh, beautiful leather and Wilton carpet, this individual car was built for the Countess of Rosebery, uh, who was uh, obviously quite a high-powered lady. And uh, when she retired, she moved from their estates in Mentmore in Buckinghamshire and went to their home in Edinburgh, 
where the car resided for many years. It did change hands later and was acquired by somebody who bought it from a small family garage and they were a little overwhelmed by the size of this car. And so he did a straight swap. He had a nearly new Fiat 500 and did a straight swap provided they put two new tires on the Bentley, which by anybody's standards must have been quite a good deal. Uh, later, uh, this gentleman became a lady. So uh, again, I possibly have got the only Bentley being owned by a countess and a transsexual, but somebody else might know different. And about a year ago, the BBC rang me and asked if I could get the car to Port Marion for some filming. Uh, having visions of uh, that wonderful television series of long ago of The Prisoner, I anticipated something similar. So when I questioned them, I was a bit disappointed to discover that it was to be used filming an episode of Mr. Tumble for CBeebies. But it does give the car quite a lot of colourful history. The history of uh, Bentley Motors is quite fascinating because W.O. Bentley was involved in the motor trade and was something of a racer himself in his youth. And he teamed up with his brother and they um, sold a car called a DFP before the First World War. Uh, he was a qualified engineer, been trained at uh, the lo a locomotive works to build railway engines, which of course was top technology in those days. And he joined the Royal Naval Air Service and designed two rotary engines which went into fighter planes. A lot of pilots were lost not through enemy action but by engine failure and he quite rightly thought this was a disgraceful thing. So he built these engines very successfully. They went into Sopwith Camels and um, similar fighter planes. Interestingly at one point he was with a driver and they had to dive into a ditch to avoid being shot up by possibly the Red Baron. Um, the Red Baron was allegedly shot down by a fighter pilot using one of Bentley's engines, funnily enough. Although now it's believed that perhaps he was brought down by an Australian machine gunner. But coming back to Bentley after the war, he wanted to build a, a car that um, typified the same spirit as a fighter plane. And he set up in business and in 1919 produced his first car, a three litre. They went through a whole range of cars, went into motor racing with huge success at Brooklands and Le Mans, with some wonderful stories attached to that. And he was quite a brilliant engineer. However, he was not a very good businessman. And fortunately, he had the Bentley boys, the famous, some very wealthy drivers who kept the company afloat. One of whom was Wolf Bonato, who became company chairman. But eventually, uh, having produced an eight litre car in 1930, which at the height of a depression was perhaps not the best of timing. The company went belly up and even Wolf Bonato felt he couldn't sustain it any longer. Bentley had come to an agreement with Napier that he was going to uh, join them and they wanted to get back into the large car market. But unfortunately, by the back door, Rolls-Royce put in a bid which uh, bought them the whole company. And so they took over Bentley Motors and formed a new company called Bentley Motors 1931 Limited. And then uh, after two years they put an experimental engine into an experimental chassis and launched a new model which is called a three and a half litre and I happen to be the lucky owner of one of those as well. Then uh, they built these cars in Derby for about six years. Then war intervened. They built a shadow factory at Crewe which is not very far away from here and after the war the uh, 
crew factory took over all the motor works and the aeroplane engines went back to Derby. Vickers owned the motor car division of Rolls-Royce, as it was, but were more concerned with other interests, it would seem, because there wasn't a sufficient investment in the factory. I had a friend who worked in the IT department there about um, over 20 years ago, and uh, he arranged a visit, and we went round one Saturday morning. I was staggered because they could have still been building Merlin engines for Spitfires with the technology that I saw there. And I'm not an engineer, but it was even apparent to me. And so when Volkswagen bid for the company and put the money into it, and uh, I've been on a number of visits, one only about a month or so ago, uh, each time I go, I'm impressed by the amount of investment that's gone in the modern production line, which um, is as good as any in the world. In the past, um, Bentley was designed to be a fast sports car. Open air, rugged, uh, not usually one that your wife would appreciate. And in fact, um, I must say that at some rallies I've been on and events, uh, the gentlemen who own the open cars are arriving with their wives, looking a little disheveled, it's quite apparent there have been some fairly heavy domestic issues discussed on the way. But uh, Rolls-Royce, of course, has always been much more refined and uh, quieter and uh, luxurious. Uh, Rolls-Royce himself used the word waft. One couldn't normally describe a vintage Bentley as wafting. So uh, there's always been that slight differentiation. However, back in the 60s, 70s, the two marks really were merged. There was no difference at all. Even the Bentley models, which are identical to the Silver Shadow, had Rolls-Royce on the speedometer. And they really were not appreciating that they were sitting on such an historical mark. Then, in the mid to late 80s, they seemed to wake up to the fact that the wrong people anyway were buying Rolls-Royces. Pop stars were buying them and driving them into swimming pools. Uh, big, certain band members were buying big Rolls Royces and painting them funny colours. And so a lot of people didn't want to be associated with that sort of thing. And they realised that they needed to make a differentiation. There was also a market for people who were buying BMW 7 Series, people who aspired to have a luxury car but didn't want to have a Rolls Royce. And so they started uh, producing sporting Bentleys, with the, starting off with the Bentley 8 and developing through time to the Turbo R. They revived the name Continental, which is a two-door coupe in the early 90s, a superb car today, now getting much sought after. And uh, right up to the present day, where because of the division between Rolls-Royce and Bentley, which took place when Volkswagen bought uh, Rolls-Royce and Bentley accrue, but lost the trademarks to BMW. Uh, then Rolls-Royce cars stopped being produced there and went down to Goodwood. And so now we have these two quite different companies producing cars. And Volkswagen have done a marvelous job at crew and uh, invested enormous amounts of money. And they're still producing cars which do carry the ethos of Bentley to this very day. Rolls-Royce have always been uh, very conservative and uh, the development of their cars is very, very slow. They make small improvements all the time and they're still doing it. And um, this car really is a development of the cars that were built at Derby. 
In fact, um, some experts and historians of the mark would actually class this car as uh, the last of the Derby cars because it uh, can trace its lineage right the way back to the car I've mentioned before, the three and a half litre. This car had a different um, engine layout. It's a straight six. It's four and a half litres. The Mark VI was only four and a quarter litres. And the extra quarter litre does seem to make a difference. Top speed of the car was about 105 miles an hour when it was new. Doesn't sound particularly fast to us today, maybe, but if you think back to the 1950s and Morris Miners, little Austin A35s, Ford Anglias, of which I used to own one, uh, struggled to get up to about 70 miles an hour. And uh, this car would cruise effortlessly all day at 80 miles an hour, um, law permitting, of course. The cars were generally fitted with automatic gearboxes. And although this was designed to be an owner-driver car, whereas Rolls-Royces were usually chauffeur-driven, uh, this car has got a manual gearbox. And uh, within club circles, it's recognized that this particular gearbox is like the proverbial knife through butter. It has synchro mesh uh, from second, third and fourth gears. And the instruction book says you should start in second gear and in practice, you can get the car to 20 miles an hour in second gear, put it into top, and then it drives like an automatic anyway. So it's an extremely torquey and flexible engine. The mechanics are very straightforward. There's no electronics to worry about. It's got a coil ignition. Uh, it's very accessible. You can actually get your hands under the bonnet and don't have to lift things out of the way. And in fact, somebody once described it as like a big Morris Minor. Well, it's a lot bigger than a Morris Minor, but I understand the point. It's a very simple piece of engineering. One very useful feature all Rolls Royces have is it has an oil reservoir onto the bonnet, which you keep filled. And then to lubricate the chassis, you simply press a pedal underneath the dashboard. Uh, it saves hours of crawling around wearing overalls with a grease gun. Another interesting thing is that Rolls Royce always saw some Body else's idea, if they thought it was a good one, they licensed it and improved it. And way back in the 20s, they uh, licensed a brake servo system from a company called Hispano Suiza, which is a, a gearbox driven clutch servo. So it's fitted to this car as well, which means that uh, the faster you go, the more powerful the brakes are. It's not hydraulic, it's simply driven off a clutch off the side of the gearbox. Tricky when you have an MOT test because it doesn't work on a rolling road. So you can see the car has got many innovations, some going back an awful long way, but still work very well. With uh, regard to uh, the cost of running a car like this or owning a car like this, there are two ways of looking at it. One is you've got to be prepared to put your hand in your pocket to keep the car in good order. And in fact, it would be a tragedy if you didn't do such a thing because the cars deserve it and warrant it. They warrant it as well because uh, over time, these cars do not depreciate. In fact, um, they appreciate quite considerably. And certain models of Rolls-Royce, a few years ago, a car like this would not have been worth um, a fraction of what it's worth today. But in the last 10 years, people have appreciated that uh, this is a, an extremely fine car. There are not that many of them around. And in terms of an investment, what better? You can't drive around in a bank account. You can't give pleasure to other people and you don't get any pleasure from it yourself except counting it. But it doesn't warrant the same experience as it does driving around in this wonderful piece of machinery. Servicing, of course, is uh, another element to take into account. But because of the chassis lubrication system, that's taken care of automatically, providing you remember to press that pedal every now and again. Uh, and that does the job mostly. Then you're down to things like oil and filter changes, and this does have um, a disposable oil filter, which um, is an important thing to have. Then cleaning the points and replacing the plugs, perhaps, and the uh, condenser might go. But beyond that, uh, checking the levels and so on, it's very, very simple and uh, not expensive to maintain. In fact, most jobs are well within the reach of uh, the average owner driver as a precaution, even if the mileage is low. In fact, more so if the mileage is low, 
to at least change the oil once a year, check the levels in the back axle and the gearbox and so on. Once again, you lift the carpets on this, there's a little rubber cover, lift that, there's a dipstick and you pull the dipstick out and it tells you how much oil is in the gearbox. Uh, as far as the oil in the engine is concerned, if you don't want to open the bonnet and use the dipstick in the bonnet, under the bonnet, uh, there's a little button on the dashboard and uh, when you switch the ignition on and press that button it will tell you exactly how much oil is in there because it uh, shows on the fuel gauge. So Bentley drivers tend to keep their hands clean. A lot of people are worried about the uh, fuel consumption on a car like this and it's fair to say that uh, maybe about 18 to the gallon is uh, you're doing quite well. It can drop to uh, just under single figures if you're doing a lot of stop for starting or in traffic. And it has also been said that a Bentley can pass anything on the road except a petrol station, which does have some truth in it. But when you're using a car like this as a pleasure vehicle, then um, it's a cost that you happily pay. And of course, it does keep a lot of people in employment at the petrol stations as well. And uh, it's probably cheaper than a subscription at a golf club as well. It has a gentle but imperious note, I think, that horn, don't you? Very aristocratic sounding. <laughs> it says politely, get out of my way, rather than just get out of the way. A lot of people uh, would be concerned about owning an old car uh, and getting hold of uh, spare parts for them. And uh, that can be a problem for people. But Rolls-Royce and Bentley cars are extremely well supported. There's an association of uh, companies who get together and agree to manufacture and supply different parts. Um, a little while ago, I managed to buy a set of new pistons for my 1934 car, which arrived in the original boxes. Um, when I had a, a BMW, I had to wait six weeks to get a boot seal from Germany. Uh, other small parts I can get almost overnight. Some of the parts, it's true, can be expensive, but then when cars were made in such small numbers, um, you would expect to pay a little bit of a premium for such things. But um, I would say that uh, there is nothing that I couldn't get for this car uh, if I needed it. You can actually buy uh, the equivalent of a Rolls-Royce Silver Shadow for under £10,000. You may have a few big bills to pay, but uh, so it's very affordable. And so the Bentley Drivers Club embraces people who own the most expensive cars up to the modern Continental GT and everything in between. Uh, the club organizes events around the world. There are about three and a half thousand members worldwide. Uh, a new section opened recently in Germany. There are rallies all around the world. People take their cars to places like South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, um, America, and uh, drive them all over the place. Somebody recently drove, um, the two Bentleys drove from, the, from Peking to Paris. The cars arrived at their destination somewhat shattered, but not as shattered as their drivers, because I met one who was describing it to us. So it's a very democratic, and a very friendly and very social club.
immense power of the engine and the torque, as I said earlier, gives you the ability to pull away in second gear and if you're moving at about 15, 20 miles an hour, drop it into top gear and you can virtually stay there all day. You can even pull away in top gear. Of course, the uh, downside is the thirst. They say a Bentley can pass anything except a petrol station. And it was true in the 50s as much as it is today, I think. The steering is light. The brakes are servo-assisted, as all Rolls-Royce products were from the uh, early 30s. The suspension on the front is independent, which gives a, a nice ride and still maintains uh, sensitivity. And it's got uh, cart springs on the back, as they all had. When you're in the car, you tend to forget that you're actually in such a prestigious and majestic looking car. But uh, you're soon made aware of the fact because it makes people smile. Children wave, uh, people flash their lights, toot their horns, and uh, it's a rather nice feeling to think that not only are you getting a lot of pleasure out of driving the car, but you're actually giving pleasure to other people as well. And uh, on a patriotic note, uh, it's um, a piece of fine British engineering, and heaven knows we're a bit short of that these days, but it still flies the flag for Britain. Well said, Peter, and thanks for sharing this beautiful and imposing 1954 Bentley R with us today. And as Peter says, it doesn't cost a fortune to get hold of your own piece of motoring heritage in a Rolls or Bentley from the 80s or 90s, still readily available for not a lot of money. More classics coming soon. See you again.